it's time for us to check back in with the nine brides and Granny Hyatt and see what happens next. If you've missed any of the previous readings, just look in the description below for a playlist. Um, the one today that we're reading really gets me teared up. So if I, if I get teary-eyed, you'll just have to overlook that. Reminds me of all the times when I was in elementary school and I had teachers read to us. A lot of times maybe it would be where the red fern grows or one like that. And even the teacher, the whole class would get teared up, but especially the teacher who was reading it. So if, if I show some emotion, you'll just have to look over it. I'm, I'm sure you'll feel the same emotion that I do. As soon as there could be a wedding, Ellie and John Lee went away. The brave old wish book and Corey settled down to practical business. To the last musty whiff of the 500th brown edge page, Corey knew the treasures contained in that two pound stack. But until now, Corey had been only a wisher. Now she was to be a haver. It thrilled and scared her. She had studied until she knew the heft and feel of every article pictured in the book. And here she was doing it all over again, but this time with the purchase price in her grasp. It was so important, so vastly important to be right and to have no regrets, and it stretched out the fun. Sometimes Ma helped. Ma took the book in her hands, which work had never managed to make unpretty, and with eyes not used to reading, she looked mighty hard at the splendid glitter. She saw so much for a body to hanker for that she always ended up by shutting the book with a clap apple cores and astrakhans and arch supports and Smyrna rugs and steel ranges. The things one could buy if greenbacks grew on hemlocks. But the thing that counted, she vowed, and the only thing was the fulfilling of Corey's want and wishing. That was what Ellie had whittled her fox and made her journey for. Such fortune wouldn't knock on the Beckett's door again. Uncle Bide was another whose advice Corey sought. He came in from his grimy forge and took the book in his paws. He did his best to sort out something for Corey while keeping his eyes off anvils, hoof knives, and spring wagons. He liked the lady tacking down eight fluffy pads of cotton into an elastic mattress and was strongly taken with the woven wire springs. He'd made Corey's rope and feather bed himself and knew its shortcomings. And there was Grandsir. He stomped into the little bedroom with swamp mud on his shins and took the book onto his knee. He went past the corsets, bust pads, petticoats, and hair switches as if they were porcupines getting ready to quill him. But he slowed down at the breech-loading, hammerless shotguns. Grandsir had been knocking crows out of the corn with a muzzle loader all his life. Since most of the merchandise was for people who were up and doing like himself, he wasn't much help to Corey, but he did finally light on a magic lantern and a kit of slides of the Klondike Gold Rush and Far West, including grizzly bears and big trees. He thought that she might find a peck of enjoyment in owning that. There were the neighbors whose opinions Corey invited whenever they dropped in the vases of Little Piney, who numbered 17 and lived on parsnips, the 14 Annabelles up the mountain who lived on buck and beans and anything they could borrow, the ridge-running Hardys, father and three sons who lived on whiskey and tobacco, the eight Cornets deep in the laurel who lived on practically nothing, and Amos Toller, keeper of the mountain store, and his grandson Kyle. Few of these neighbors could move through the type but not a one yielded to anybody at reading pictures. That's what I would get if I was you, Corey, urged Aunt Aretha Annabelle, pointing to a trust guaranteed to help one to sit up, if not actually walk. Levisy Vasey, tall and spare, squealed over the smooth, dainty, nainsook nightgowns. If I had skin as soft as yours, Corey, said Levisy, I'd purely want something nicer below the neck than flower sacking. And Uncle Epp Tidnanny put in a powerful word for a beautiful rest-easy fringed hammock with layback pillow. From end to end of the holler, everyone rejoiced in the jackpot of pleasure and comfort that had come to Corey Beckett. 
Corey worked on her list until it figured out to $26.90, counting shipping costs. She added seven cents for candy, allowed three for the stamp, and made out the ruled form at the back of the book. Uncle Bide, who was stretched out extra long from axe swinging, but walked with a lurch because the axe had come down wrong one time, gimped the two miles to the post office at Toller's Mountain Store. Corey hadn't figured on a money order, but old Amos Toller insisted on supplying that. It was one of the privileges of representing the United States government at Toller's Corner, he said, and he'd be responsible for the 15 cents himself till Congress refunded him the money. Corey asked Uncle Bide anxiously, How long will it take for my package to come? Warned Bide, It's likely to be a right weary and spell, Corey. He knew how long it took to make a watertight bucket or a pair of gate hinges, and whatever Corey had checked off out of that wishing book would probably keep the people in Chicago a grinding till hell frizz. His tone implied centuries. It was to take even longer. It was to take until never. A letter came addressed to Miss Corinda Beckett. Dear Madam, this acknowledges your recent order. There appears to be a misunderstanding. We do not stock any of the articles you mention. Is it possible you have consulted an obsolete catalog? We are sending you our latest edition under separate cover and enclose our check herewith for $26.97. According to our older employees, the goods you ordered are quoted in our catalogs of approximately the McKinley era. As we have occasional calls for these old volumes for libraries, universities, and motion picture studios, and our own files were destroyed in the Clark Street Fire of 1904, we are willing to pay liberally for such historic relics. In exchange for your present catalog, we shall be pleased to credit you with $3, and we offer a reasonable sum, dependent upon age and condition, for any other old issues in your possessions, assuring you of our eager desire to serve Chicago Mail Order Corporation. Three dollars for that old book, exclaimed Uncle Bide. Why, Corey, there's more of them things in the peeler's tumble-down haymo. Maybe a dozen. I'll fotch an armful in first thing tomorrow. Some of the books were under a ton of rotted hay, and there were many more than he had remembered. With cover pictures of plump-armed goddesses spilling cornucopias of Turkish couches, banjos, and three-bottle breakfast casters, they ran back to the World's Fair year of 1893. And there were some in plain covers that reached to the day of the Philadelphia Centennial and the High Wheel Bicycle. Bide promised to tote them to Marion Borough and express them off as soon as he got a hog brine down and his apples in. The new wish book arrived. It was a gorgeous book, and it made Corey's head swirl. Polo coats and checked velour knickers and coal scuttle hats and pajamas and elastic girdles, the world had moved several notches. Not that those things fitted into Corey's usings, but there was a tilt-up bed with a cool spring mattress which Uncle Bide, as soon as he had taken in the details, grew almost church reverent over and a chair on wheels that the sitter could propel by a push of her own hands, only the hauler didn't have much in the way of paths to run it on, and a walking machine made out of lightweight tubing. So Corey studied the new book and licked her stumpy pencil. Once more, folks dropped in a plenty to give advice. They tracked Ma Beckett's sand-scrubbed floor, and they helped wire out the pages. It was a lengthy business, consuming most of the summer and fall, but Corey finally got to the end of it. Not knowing what the old books would bring exactly, she made her order list a little bulgy and marked the extra or maybe things with question marks. Bide filled a bushel basket with the books the peelers had abandoned and lashed it to his mule and struck off for Marion Burrow. 
Corey waved goodbye with a special wave to the wish book she had cherished all her girlhood. She lay back to wait. It was the toller boy, Kyle, who spread the word that Corey's grand return tote of mail was in sight, because for what else would a wagon be jouncing up mud on the coal mountain road from Marion Borough? Most holler letters, and there weren't many, came in by saddlebag. It was the tidings the neighbors had been waiting for. They set aside fish pole and heaved aside hoe and tracked for the Beckett house, beaming their pleasure at Corey's luck and eager to see her new bed and new walking machine. They said their howdies and squeezed into the neat clabbered house, bringing tang of glen and hilltop, of clover field and cow yard. Ellie and John were there, too. They came straight down off Old Dad Knob the minute John, whose eyesights were sharp, spied all that movement around the Beckett house. Kyle Toller came in breathless and wanted to know, since Corey couldn't go to the store, could the postmaster borrow Bide's mule for the last leg of the delivery? Corey was sitting up. She'd never had looked so pretty or excited. She had on a sugar sack nightgown that smelled of sun and ironing, and she'd thrust a spray of rose geranium in her hair. Here they come, reported Beach Trevitt from the fork of the quince tree by the gate. The official party was advancing, sure enough. Bide had washed his mule and put a circle of yellow witch hazel blossoms around its neck. Amos Toller strode at Bide's elbow, and his beard blew wide. He had his split tail coat on, the one he'd once helped nominate Teddy Roosevelt in. The mule slipped and slid down the leaves. He wasn't loaded near as lofty as folks had expected. The pile on him was nothing like what a wheelchair in a wove spring bed would make. There was only a pair of barrels atop of him. When Grand Sir saw those stained old barrels, he yelped some. They were his barrels for sprouting chop in when he was blockade liquor minded. But Amos said, Hush your fuff, Nathan, and beckoned to Fell Annabelle and other strong backs to help Bide fetch the barrels into Corey's little room. Corey looked as pleased as a robin with a six inch worm. Amos, drawing his whiskers into two banners, launched himself a speech. Corinda Beckett, he pronounced, like he was addressing the multitudes from the steps of the Capitol at Washington. In the name of the United States government, whose representative I am in these parts, and in joyful defiance of postal rules and regulations, I hereby declare the Cat Track Hollow Post Office open for business in this room. Corey, your mail has a rove. I'm sorry to be so much trouble, Corey said. Bide lift off the barrel heads. They came right off. Amos thrust a hand down. He brought out a package, small and square. This here matter, postmarked Chicago, has been entrusted for conveyance and delivery to a Miss Levisia Vasey. Levisy, you in the room? Come forward and be identified exclaimed Levisy. Who in the holler doesn't know me, but who in Chicago does? Amos fished again. Wendy Bill Vasey. I served my time, shouted Uncle Bill. If it's papers, I ain't here. Nathan Beckett. Grandsaw's jaw dropped the way it did whenever Amos flung a ringer that knocked off his two leaners. I won't accept service, said the senior Beckett. I don't make a drop, and what's more, I age it half a year, swooshing it in a limber tree on a windy hill, and how many men in this county are that careful? Or if it's for dynamite and a few fish, I'm being persecuted. I don't hold with that law, neither. Miss Aster Tidnanny, catch her boys, Aster honey, shove right under that old roarer's legs. By this time, Levisy Vasey, after inspecting all six sides of her flat parcel, smelling it, shaking it, and listening to it, had slid the string off. She prized up one corner of the wrapping and squealed. Aster Tidnanny, who was nine, wasn't making a sound. She couldn't. Miss Deborah Cornett? 
A young lady of Miss Astor's age wriggled through and halted, unbelieving. Here you are, Debbie, sweetheart. Take it away and see if you can find your tongue when Astor does. Lee McLeese? The floor became littered with torn paper. It lay like leaves of fall, and it reached out to the side porch. People were in a stir, and cries were shrill. Among them were Lark Beckett's, Corey and Ellie's mother. She'd been handed a real big parcel with her name on it, and in it were Persian pattern dress material, a roll of camisole lace, six pairs of black stockings, and twelve china dishes. Levisy Vasey stood rigid, dumbfoundment and rapture on her plain face and a tiny Nansook bloomer combination with elastic knees and lace bodice top scrunched out of sight in her hands. Aster and Flax and Alyssum and Myrtle Tiddenanny and Debbie and Katie Jo and Vernice and Ona Cornet hugged dolls so tightly that they almost smashed the living squeaks out of them. Aunt Effie Tiddenanny stood regarding a baby peach tree that had come in a pasteboard tube, and Aunt Zelda Podlasky had five or six paper packets with pictures on them of the prettiest sweet peas, violets, spice pinks, and candy tufts that ever snuggled a fence. And still, old Amos plunged arm into barrel and brought packets out. A reel of baby dress flouncing for Aunt Poppy McLeese, a skinning knife for Kyle Toller, a sequin-covered beanie for Silver Moon Annabelle, an ankle brace for Granny Height, an ocarina for Eret Annabelle, who could charm the sow bugs out of a stump with his jug tootling, but had never got over an early fall on his head. And there was more, much more, a hearing tube for Uncle Tom Swisher, who was always cross because he never knew what folks were saying, a bright little silver bead necklace for Kedron Hardy, who never had anything pretty in her born days. A family medicine case for Aunt Aretha Vasey that was all set for colic, colds, burns, pleurisy, nervous troubles, and pimples. A bottle of something new, vitamin pills, for Aunt Belle Gunderson up on her mountain. Belle was too huge and ailing to make the long trudge down, but somebody would take it to her a baseball for Beach Trevitt, and a bat for North Cornet, and an ivorette comb and brush for Travis Swisher, and a pair of sparkling side combs for Esther Podlasky. For Uncle Bide, there was nothing but an envelope with a bill of lading. But the lading notice was of a three-horsepower gasoline engine waiting for him at the Marionboro Freight Depot. A 10-power, 13-inch telescope for John Lee and a set of carving chisels. For Ellie, who had tramped through rain and over mountain to the fair to start all of this, a red wool flannel jacket, whipcord knickers, two pair of thick gray stockings, and a folding knife with four blades. For others, there were paint boxes, mouth organs, hair clips, there were turkey bells, team bells, dehorning clippers, hog ringing tools, oxen horn balls, and hoof trimmers. For Postmaster Toller, there was a porch thermometer and a cold weather cap. Sixty-one packages in all, including one for Bide's mule, he got a sweat pad. Bust my bones, breathed Grand Sir, standing in his new Storm King rubber boots and heisting and lowering his double-barreled blue steel hammerless shotgun and rubbing his hand over the sleek stock. There was still another package for Grand Sir. It contained a warm woolen union suit. Horse high, pig tight, and bull strong, admired Amos when Grand Sir broke it out and held it up. Pa Hardy kept staring at his corn planter. Stated Amos, straightening, the bottom of the barrels have a rove cried Mrs. Beckett. But, Corey, there's nothing for you. Oh, yes, there is, said Corey, her cheeks bright as rhododendrons. I have the new wish book. Every time she'd open it, the memory of this day would return. Uncle Bide whispered, Pick out anything you want in that book, Corey, just about any darn thing, so it's wood or iron or feathers or leather, 
I bet I can make it. I'll start right in with a tilled up bed and next with a chair on wheels and I'll turn out every man in the holler to see there's a good wide path brushed out for it. We'll shove a path clear to Toller's store, won't we folks? The hell beatenest path in the whole dang country, swore Grand Sir, for the hell beatenest girl. The pain hadn't come on, thought Corey blissfully. It was nearly nightfall but the pain hadn't come on as it usually did at this hour. Perhaps it was never going to again. If it did, she would bury her nose in the new wish book. There must be at least 10,000 pictures in it and 600 close-packed pages to read and read. We'll stop right there for today. How sweet, how wonderful that Corey all that kindness that they they all was in on the family ellie and uncle bide for sure trying to get ellie to go and sell the fox and it all worked out and they got the money and then corey turned it around and spent it all on them mm. gets you don't it it's such a sweet story uh, something for all of us to aspire to that kind of generosity really really inspiring I loved all the language through this part. I didn't write any of the words down, but so many of them just sound like home to me, still used here today. Um, I really love that. I love at the very beginning, before they realize the first wish book is obsolete and can't really get nothing out of it, I love the part where she says the uh, stretched out with anticipation. Corey recognized already that that was the that was what was the good part for her, the fun part. The part about looking through the book and dreaming, dreaming. So often our dreams are so much better than actuality a lot of times. That is something that we, in today's fast paced world, I think we overlook is the, the wonder of dreaming and the anticipation. It's like my favorite holiday of the year is Christmas. I really love Christmas. I love what it means because of being a believer that. I love the camaraderie of my family at Christmas. But even I have to admit, the joyous part, a lot of it comes before Christmas, is the maybe getting ready for it, whether that's if you're in a church play or something like that, if you're you know, just decorating your house, cooking the good foods, planning the special day, buying the presents for those you love, all that anticipation. So I really, really love that part. It's such a good story. I, really good the author is really good writer to make you feel like you were there i could feel like i was in that little tiny bedroom and when the people kept clomping in and messing up the floor mrs beckett probably thought i'm tired of cleaning up but at the same time brings Corey such joy let them make the mess and and then the description of them all packing in there and the smells they brought with them from the cow yard to the glen to the, you know just the beautiful outdoors the meadows or meadows as they might have said at that time I, I really love those that image and can just see it in my mind. It's so heartwarming. This story reminds me, this part of the book reminds me of a story. I've shared it in another video, but I'll share it again, is that Pap told me about when he was a boy, kind of over the mountain behind me here in Pine Log. He was living there, him and his family, and uh, they went to church, Pine Log Church, and there was a gentleman down the road that had a tree, and I don't know what kind of tree, I don't even think Pap told me, but it was different. It was a pine tree, but different from our pine trees. Someone had probably brought it with them somewhere or ordered it like the peach tree the one lady got from Corey. And they planted it, and it had grew, and it was a big, huge tree. And it had pine cones on it that was different than the ones from here, so it had big pine cones on it. And everybody admired those pine cones, especially when it came to the holidays, to Christmas, thinking about Christmas. So one day, the man that owned the land there at church said, I just want to tell everybody that they're welcome to come get all the pine cones they want. And you know, use them for Christmas decorations and all that. They, I've done got my family's got what we want. There's a bunch out there. You can have all you want. Just come get them. So Pap said in two or three days, he decided he'd go down there. He'd walk down the road and go to the man's house and he'd get a few for his mother and his grandmother, big grandma. And he went down there to get them and there wasn't one left, not one. And so as the week went on, he kind of heard from other folks that they had went, and there wasn't one pine cone, not one. Somebody had got them all instead of just taking one or two so that everybody could have them. Somebody 
had got them all, and they were all so disappointed and thinking, who was it? Who stole them all? You know, who was so greedy? Who, who was a greedy guy? Well, the next Sunday at church, they found out who it was. It was uh, a lady I knew as Big Mama. Pap called her Lenore. She's since passed away, but she grew up with Pap there. It was Lenore. She was just a little girl, too, like Pap was a little boy. And she had borrowed her um, her father, her grandfather, whoever it was, borrowed a wagon. And she had went and picked up all the pine cones. And then her plan was she brought them to church so that everybody could just get one, get them, you know, she made it easy for them. She was bringing them for that. So there was nobody that had stolen them or been greedy. She had just brought them to share with everyone at church because she thought that was, you know, would be... Uh, make it easy on everyone. So she had that kind heart, obviously, that, that Corey does in the book. I hope you enjoyed this part of the book. Uh, it may have made you tear up like it does me. It's just such a sweet story. Uh, please leave a comment and tell me what part you liked best, what jumped out at you. And as always, I hope you drop back by next week because now we've got to see what happens next. I'm, I'm sure this now it's going to go to somebody else's story. One of those nine brides is going to be encouraged to tell her story and we're going to going to get to hear a different story.